So let's go ahead and, and as we start to talk about our, our webinar today, death of the single carrier, building a successful regional carrier strategy. Our guests today are from Lasership and LSO. I'd like to get a little bit of housekeeping done first. Please note, there are no call-in numbers. You must listen via your, your, your computer speakers. Um, there will be an option for recording after this. So if you do have to drop off, you won't miss the end of it. We're gonna record this entire thing. We will encourage you, please ask questions. And on the tool over here, you can see that there's the ability to ask questions, submit those at any point in time. As a matter of fact, if you have questions that, that you wanna to send to the panel, the sooner you submit them, the sooner our, our, our team in the back coalesces them and gets them to, to, to me, the host. And we will try to even ask them in the segments that match. If not, we'll have a follow-up uh, Q&A at the very end. And while you're looking at that, there's also three handouts that are available as part of this webinar. Please feel free to download, download those as you see fit. And with that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to welcome my panel today. I've got uh, Dick Metzler, I've got Josh Dinn, I've got uh, David McQuinn and myself. And we're just gonna go right across the screen and actually ask everybody to please go ahead and introduce yourself. So Dick, let's start with you. Great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dick Messler. I'm the CEO of LSO, aka Lone Star Overnight. A lot of years of experience in the parcel industry, FedEx, uh, TNT, DHL. Also background uh, fulfillment and trucking. As a matter of fact, my mother and dad met at my grandfather's warehousing and trucking company in the south side of Pittsburgh. So it's literally in my DNA. And who says there's no love stories in logistics? <laughs> Excellent. Josh, let's get an introduction from you. Josh, you're still on mute. Yeah. I was on mute. Thank you, Justin. And uh, great to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, I'm Josh Janine. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Lasership. Uh, I've been here about 20 years in a variety of sales operations uh, and supply chain roles where I uh, developed and grew out at Lasership's e commerce network. Excellent. And David. Good afternoon. I'm David McQuinn. I've been with ProShip for nearly four years now, and I am in charge of our carrier liaison and uh, relationship building with our different carriers. Excellent. And I'm your host, Justin Kramer, co-founder of ProShip. Uh, so I've been doing this for, for two decades and a little bit more, but we don't need to talk about that. Let's move on to our topic for the day. Um, we're going to be looking at a couple of different things. Again, here's a great opportunity for you to if you have questions in any of these areas, let us know. But we're gonna be talking about the market. We're gonna be talking about what's the differences between the different carrier types. Uh, we're gonna be talking about why you might wanna to go towards a regional strategy, how you would do that, how long it might take. Really um, uh, talk about some of the market, customer expectations. Of course, what's on all of our minds is in another quarter here, we're all gonna be in peak. And then of course, as I mentioned, we're gonna go through some Q&A stuff. So let's go ahead and, and let's start with the state of the market, okay? As, as we look through this, um, uh, guys, there's, there's, as we look here, we see a lot of different things. We see coverage from different carriers from, from, from different areas. We also see service deserts, both from a pickup as well as a delivery side. Um, but I can tell you uh, uh, in, in my 20 years in the business, we're seeing a lot smaller deserts, right? Um, so I, I guess, uh, and, and, and Dick, I'm gonna start with you. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about the competition in the market, in, in, the, uh, in the regional area. Um, and if you wanna touch on why there's some service deserts in certain areas, that would be appreciated as well. Sure, uh, well, I uh, am in the middle there, the green area of Lone Star Overnight. And we don't overlap with any of the other regional carriers. So guys like Josh and I, we collaborate on things. We really don't compete, you know, when it's all said and done. But on the West Coast, in GLS, much uh, more closely compete. And uh, to a lesser degree, because they service different markets, I think Speedy and UDS. But so far as the deserts go, it, it's just a function of where the population is. And I think everybody can agree that population e-commerce orders are closely correlated. 
So, you know, that's really what it comes down to. It, will some of these places eventually get filled in? Uh, maybe, but uh, probably probably not totally. Even in some of the colored in areas, it's not 100% coverage uh, uh, when it's all said and done. So, but, you know, we probably cover collectively 80 plus percent of the U.S. population, you know, when it's all said and done. And that's more than adequate for most of our e-commerce customers to think about a regional strategy. Excellent. Josh, let me hand the question over to you. But also in your region of the country, let's face it, we've seen a lot of startups and we've seen a couple of uh, companies already exit the market already. So could you talk about the competitive nature and uh, maybe touch a little bit about some of the volatility that you're seeing as well? Sure, and I would agree with, with Jake. Really, there's really not much overlap, uh, uh, you know, I guess, other than the, the actual West Coast. Uh, you know, and if you if really were putting up tombstones, you'd see a few more scattered around uh, the country for uh, a lot of startups, really kind of technology platforms. When you think about companies like Delive or Doorman, and, you know, I'll stop there because it, it is a longer list. Uh, they're looking for critical mass point-to-point -point deliveries or startups where they're looking sort of, you know, anybody can do kind of inner city, uh, but once you start to go to an actual regional footprint where you need the actual network, you need the facilities and the assets on the ground, it gets hard to replicate very quickly. And so when you look at even where LaserShip is or some of the other regionals, you really have to have a good breadth of service area to make it an attractive solution for the retailer to be able to carve out enough area for the door, right? Uh, you know, enough to integrate the new system, to have a multi-carrier solution. Uh, that enables the flexibility to add a carrier or two, et cetera, as you're looking to diversify from a national carrier and create opportunity for, you know, cost savings, synergies, uh, faster time in transit to consumers. And so, uh, you know, really, I think that we're going to see some more startups, right? There's a lack of capacity sort of in general in the market. We're probably going to see some new entrants and, and uh, probably still more in the technology side, I think. They continue to kind of pop up, but uh, history so far has shown that um, they are not able to last. Excellent, thank you. Well, you know what? I, I really realize that what we should probably be talking about a bit, as well as, is what is the difference, All right? So, Josh, I'm, I'm going to go back to you. Um, what's the difference between uh, regional carriers and the national carriers? Sure. You know, look, it's going to come down to a, a few basis points, but ultimately, right? The national carriers, you know, do what they do very well. They, they service the entire country, in most cases, the entire world. And they also service all types of packages from a ladder that you can get at a, at a, at a home improvement store to, you know, a piece of a single clothing that you can get from, a, from an apparel retailer. Uh, typically, regional carriers are not built to serve, you know, all packages for all people. Uh, we typically stick within the right specific region and then follow the population trends and hit the right density pockets that make it attractive for us to be able to build pure e-commerce networks that enable consumers to receive faster time in transit. So, you know, reduce time from click to receive. Uh, we were able to uh, create a more effective network that can drive out costs and then turn that back to the retailers who can then remain competitive in the environment or mitigate cost increases from national carriers and then provide really a flexible opportunity uh, for retailers to design new things, create new services, try same day or different types of service levels to really delight and surprise the consumer. And Dick, let me pass the same question to you. Differences between what you see in, in regional carriers like yourself and, and the oligarchy that is the national carriers. Yeah, when some of my uh, former colleagues at uh, FedEx asked, gee, why would anybody use a regional carrier when they can use FedEx? There's really, Three reasons, in, in my opinion, they touch on some of Josh's points. On time uh, reliability is better, and improvement. There's third party sources to back it up. Oftentimes, there's double digit savings, even with the bigger uh, customers. We have lower overhead. You know, I don't have a football stadium named after me and don't plan to anytime soon. And, and then, thirdly, and I think in many cases, you know, this is important because I still believe the relationships in this business account. And how we treat customers with uh, respect and with flexibility and trying very hard to do it their way 
I think is what differentiates us. Uh, and those three things are not my opinion, but just me being the spokesman for what I've heard over the last three and a half years from our customers. Excellent. And I, and I wanna I want to pull Dave in on this. Dave, we write dozens of different carrier engines. Um, is there really a, uh, a major functional difference? Is there anybody gonna have to pay more or, or is it a, a more difficult uplift for, for us as a multi-carrier shipping software, uh, regionals versus nationals? None. An engine is an engine and most require labels and a label is a label regardless of whether that's a regional or a national. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so so there's really, uh, what we're trying to say is there's really not a, not a huge barrier to entry to a true multi-carrier shipping software. When it comes to adding, regionals to your national carriers but let's ask let's ask a better question so we, we've, we've talked about differences we've talked about you know from from a software side how it's it's uh, uh, not a huge difference for us but let's talk about some of the benefits that that you guys as regionals can bring I mean obviously you know, we talked about the fact you guys aren't spending your money on 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 stadiums or anything like that which which uh, I quite appreciate um, but uh, but why would somebody uh, why would somebody want to leverage um, regionals or multiple regionals? And Dick, let me go ahead and pass that to you first. Well, I think that um, it's I think of it as a in a three PL context, and you know three PLs are good at optimizing you know between modes and carriers and things of that nature, network solutions so on and so forth. Uh, it, it was very hard not so many years ago to do a, uh, a regional carrier strategy. And until uh, things like multi-carrier systems like ProShip, you know, have really come of age and capability, it was much harder to do that other than the biggest of the big. And so uh, now it's really optimizing, um, you know, that the it's in, in a lot of cases, People don't want to buy all the services any transportation provider has, either geographically or functionally, because nobody's the best at everything. So the ability to slot in who's strongest, nationals or regionals in Texas, for example, you know, is part of that optimization. And our shipper logistics professionals are the 3PL within their organization, in my view. Yeah, and and Josh, I think we've seen we've seen some differences, especially when it comes to to uh, some of the contracts as of late with the national carriers. Could you talk a little about what you're seeing with your customers versus what you're hearing about from some of the national competitors that you have? We're definitely hearing, uh, you know, I guess I said the the temperature across the board is is one where you know. Typically, and if you looked at it a few years ago, it was you know the retailers trying to work down the pricing against FedEx and UPS and pinning them off against each other. A little bit of using regional carriers to maybe offset or implement and 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 tranche off some of the volume. And it, um, coming out of the pandemic, right, things have shifted, and you know national carriers are coming a little bit more blunt with with the approach. We've heard things where uh, you know maybe you need to you know, find another carrier to deliver some of your volume, uh, extreme caps, 40, 50% price increases, uh, you know, complete, you know, mid-contract changes or termination notices, just stuff that, you know, was, has never really been heard of. Uh, and, you know, looking for really trying to right-size some of the volumes or, or, or cost, or maybe just take advantage of the opportunity in front of them. So I think, you know, look, you know, executing a strategy where you're diversifying away from a single source carrier, which, you know, certainly was the way to go 20 years ago and maybe even 10 years ago. But uh, with the, you know, the opportunity to have multi-carrier uh, solutions or software that can implement another carrier, you know, with, with ease and maybe within, you know, a week or two from, uh, from you know, sort of start to finish, uh, it makes it really more of a flexible opportunity to add a carrier and then not be really beholden to a, a carrier that can, that can really kind of come in and, and disrupt your, your, your operation model. Agreed. Agreed. Now, now Dick, I, I, we were talking earlier as we were prepping for this, and and I stole a phrase from you. And it might not be yours, but I'm attributing it to you, so it's your phrase now. 
right? And it was about the difference of approach, okay? Um, uh, and and I, it struck me because it's not something, you know, when when we talk with national carriers, it's extremely professional, cold, um, uh, and, and impersonal. But your phrase was that that as a as a regional carrier, your approach is how can we as the carrier serve you, and that the nationals often have that backwards. How can you as the customer service them? Do you want to dive into that at all? Not my quote, but I'm going to make a T-shirt out of it. So <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I I think. Um, to build someone on Josh's point as well, you know, it's it's appalling to me, you know, how things are being communicated and how customer the nationals are uh, dealing with uh, e-commerce shippers. I, I mean, I've I've never seen anything like it, and I've never seen anything like it in terms of the emotion behind it. It's visceral. <laughs> and some shippers I know, if they could find a way to punish FedEx and UPS, they would, but they can't, you know, and they know that, you know, so we can help, but, you know, let's be real, we're five to seven, maybe 10% of the market, you know, and the FedEx and UPS are going to do what's right for their shareholders uh, as long as they can to leverage their, their uh, duopoly. There's no question about it. And it's some, and we're going to build up their capacity and at some point come back and say to shippers that they dropped on their head, and oh, we were just kidding. Can we go to lunch and talk about it? You know, the that sort of thing. And I think the only way to inhibit that kind of behavior is not fall for it when they come back. Yeah, you know, Dick, I, mean, I think you'll, go ahead, Josh. you'll have to make the t-shirt. Uh, ask not what your e-commerce retailer can do for you, but what you can do for your e-commerce retailer. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And, and Josh, this next one is is towards you. So, so one of the one of the concerns that that a lot of customers ask us if they're going for a regional is they're saying, well, I only have a, a warehouse in Reno, or I only have a warehouse in Columbus. How can I use multiple regionals? So, what type of flexibility? Have you seen in the market what kind of recommendations might you have for a customer that that wants to leverage but doesn't have the regional footprint to be in your pickup area? So every regional is going to be different uh, in terms of this. So uh, some may have more flexibility and less. As an example, Laser Ship is picking up from you know we're east of the Mississippi today and we pick up from you know California every single day. Right, and so we're able to move those volumes, you know, all the way across the country, and it makes sense for us. Uh, for others that, you know, may have a combination of, you know, not just a pure online retailer, may also have brick and mortar, may all may be moving some inventory around the country. Zone skipping is definitely an option. There'll be more flexibility with a regional carrier as we look to really partner with you to say, how can we help you and come together as is really two points serving the the end consumer and. If that is, you know, you taking part of the first mile or middle mile or a combination between the two of us, let's 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 really figure out what makes the most sense and what's the most cost effective use of both those assets where we're, you know, not adding to the carbon footprint when we don't need to and, and sharing the resources to make sure that, you know, everyone's getting really the best deal that they can. And Dick, did you want to add anything to that? I know I know we talked a lot about this, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think it touches on you know, the local carrier uh, opportunity as well, but probably more than 50% an increasing of the e-commerce volume that we handle comes from outside of our service area. And so uh, in the vast majority of the cases, our customers arrange the truckload move into say our hub in Dallas, you know, for example. And, but more and more uh, customers are asking us, kind of like what Josh does on the West Coast, to do the same thing. And I've resisted doing that until very recently. And the reason is that most of my customers can buy truckload cheaper than I can, and then I've got to put a margin on it and ties up working capital. You know, it just seems to work better with certain with certain exceptions in mind for the uh, shipper to arrange uh, the truckload in. And if to one of Josh's earlier points, if you don't have enough critical mass and enough geography and uh, e-commerce population, it's hard to fill up a truckload. And if you don't fill up a truckload, it's really hard 
to make sense of the zone skipping model. You know, it 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 really is. So you know, those are the and and that's why it's tough. You know, for even a metro carrier in a big metro, you know, to participate outside their service area. And naturally, inside our service area, we make the pickup. Excellent, excellent. I'm looking at, by the way, questions are coming in and I'm trying to evaluate some of them to see if if they work in here. And and we got a question from Adam Berg that I think kind of fits in here. So uh, the question is, what options are there for origin that ship less than 200 packages per day that can't command a dropped asset? What are the minimum package requirements to make it worth doing business with a regional carrier? So I guess that's a question to you guys. What are your smaller contracts look like? Where is an entry level contract? When should somebody start looking? You know, is it is it at a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, a hundred? You know, what is that that uh, that level where it's a mutual benefit to both of you? Uh, Josh, let me start with you. Yeah, sure. The answer to that is is going to be very specific for each individual shipper, and ultimately is you know where are you located, right? So. Um, it doesn't, it likely wouldn't make sense to have somebody that ships 50 packages a day for us to be based in California, as that would be, you know, really an uh, issue of uh, volume on a vehicle. Uh, but if they're located within, you know, the leadership network, then it, it is going to make sense. We've got customers that are doing, you know, hundreds of packages a day and, you know, of course, tens of thousands. So um, it really depends on the proximity of where that location is, but really, you know, I guess that my advice would be, and this is something that happens. So folks are reaching out to us every day through our website or other uh, mediums, you know, want to explore, want to understand, you know, when does it make sense? And we can have the conversation with you and give you some guidance, whether, you know, when it would make sense for laser ship or when it would make sense, like what you should start with maybe LSO because of where you're located and the amount of volume that you have and, as you continue to grow, we grow, we'll continue to be in contact and, you know, it will start when it makes sense. And Dick, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, 200 packages a day, Adam, to your point, uh, if you have 200 packages a day and say you're in Seattle, I don't know where you're at, but say you're in Seattle and my primary service area is Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, that uh, it's going to be tough. You know, let me just be perfectly honest. I don't know how to make those zone skip economics work. Zone skip to me is really simple. It's the uh, zone differential rate times the number of packages in the truck minus the cost of the truck. I mean, either that's a positive number or it's not. I mean, it's pretty simple math. And but, but what if what if what if Adam is located in Austin? If, if, if he's in Austin, bring it on. You know, love to talk to you, Adam or anywhere in our uh, service area. But I'm just being honest in terms of, you know, what's realistic and um, and whatnot. But I think what I'm hearing more and more is that shippers, um, you know, Amazon shippers who don't use FBA, for example, and things of that nature, uh, are going to 3PLs and 3PLs are aggregating some of these lanes together and things of that nature. You know, I, I can see that being beneficial to a uh, shipper like Adam as time goes on. I don't think that's overly developed yet, by the way. Excellent. And I'm just going to, I'm going to just throw out a quick definition for those of you who don't know, FBA fulfilled by Amazon. Sorry. Right. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> No problem. No problem. Uh, all right. So let's, let's move on to, to the onboarding process. Um, uh, and, and I really, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to pull the big question off the table. Um, Dick, I was just talking with you, so the question goes back to you. Is it too late to add capacity uh, uh, via uh, on track? I'm sorry, uh, via LSO. Is it too late to add capacity this year? No, but you better be quick as a bunny rabbit, and you better be able to ship your first package no later than October 4th. Uh, if that's uh, not in your planning horizon, you know, the, I, I don't want to kid you. I don't want to waste your time. You know, uh, we're not a good option at that point, but I think we're staying out later than uh, most of the other carriers at this point, and there's a variety of reasons why. The, yeah. I think we'll touch on this a little bit later in terms of technology integration. Yeah, so LSO has a has a window, but it's a very small window. Josh, does LaserShip have any window left for this year? 
So uh, we stopped uh, taking uh, new conversations for customers in June of this year. Um, so we, you know, we onboarding over 400% more customers than we did last year uh, through the pandemic, uh, which was, you know, multiple times greater than even the year prior. Uh, we are taking reservations still and some left in January and for February so far of uh, 2022. And, uh, you know, we're going to see those uh, start to fill up here. Um, so I would encourage folks to, you know, act now and uh, really get on the train while, uh, while it's still at the station. Yeah, so, and, and we're seeing, a, for, for everybody else, we're seeing a variety of answers like both of them. For many, many most carriers, uh, whether they be nationals or regionals, uh, they are taking appointments for next year. So get on the list, get your early appointments. There are a couple left that still have, have a very small window that might be able to get you in place. But with that, because I did want to, I did want to get that big question out of the way, because I know everybody wants to know, where can I get more cat capacity before peak, right? But let's go ahead and let's talk about. Um, so, so let's say somebody is looking to onboard next year. A more reasonable timeline, something that we don't have to do an emergency uh, sake, uh, something that is uh, more along the lines of what we would see throughout the year. Um, Josh, what would you, uh, uh, what type of things would you have companies prepare for in planning, uh, so they can they can be a good partner? When they come to you and so i'd say you know as you begin to explore those make sure that you've got your it resources aligned right and, and executives uh, sponsorship and signed off on on the process moving forward you know we see the implementation timelines range anywhere from say two to three weeks to well, well greater than 90 days and you know it really depends on the integration method if they have a a multi-carrier software solution that is flexible and can add carriers, maybe has a module for an LSO or a laser ship already developed, and maybe it's just a small uh, label tweak or two uh, versus having to go direct into a, a WMS or whatever. It's really going to elongate that timeline. If that's the case, you just need to start your planning much earlier to make sure that you're not in a situation where you're cutting, you know, missing dicks cut off out on October 5th or whatever the issue might be. So I'd say that Again, you know, making sure that you understand what it's going to take to implement doing that homework up front. And, and Dick, anything to add to that about planning so that so that they become a good corporate citizen in the process? Yeah, it's like doing your taxes. You don't wait till April uh, 14th to you uh, to plan for your taxes. Kind of same thing here. Uh, I've said this many times before, but the longest pole in the tent for onboarding is three things integration 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 in that order you know that that working with uh internal technology teams having that slotted uh or with multi-carrier systems uh, having that slotted and prioritized i think is uh really important but so far as how the planning goes i mean it's typically we have a conversation get to know each other we do a capabilities overview we sign an NDA, we get package level detail, we come back with uh, pricing and service, time and transit, you know, commitments by zip code. And then we generally move the contract and then on to um, uh, integration in somewhat parallel paths. Excellent, thank you. And, and, you, and you kind of set me up for this next one, which is, which is making things faster and easier. Um, if, if you've got a homegrown system, obviously you're connecting to everything. Uh, your IT department has to do everything. Um, uh, both Josh and Dick, you both mentioned effectively making life easier by using a multi-carrier shipping software. Um, the reason this makes life easier is because you know, we've done this before. We may not be able to help you negotiate. We may not be able to help you gather the information that, that, uh, um, that, that the salesmen at the regional need. But once you've got there, we can very quickly put things in place. And Dave, can you can you uh, can you describe the difference between onboarding a carrier engine from nothing, you know, so let's say I've got a homegrown system uh, versus using a pre-certified engine. So what what do you see as the difference between starting from scratch and deploying something that your multi-carrier shipping system already has in place? If I could touch on just one topic, I would say it's a pre-certified label. If you're a single client and you need to work with multiple carriers, you're going to go through the same label with five, six, maybe more carriers. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. 
a multi-carrier software platform such as ProShip. I'm a little partial to ProShip, uh, but we've already done the legwork. It's already there. We have already certified the label. So as a client, you come through ProShip, and specifically, let's say for LSO and for LaserShip, we've already done the work. We know what their labels are. We have them certified. We're ready to go. Uh, so Justin, if, if I were to just touch on the one item, there are many more, but coming from scratch, everything has to be dealt with individually by an internal team. Coming through uh, ProShip, for instance, again, we've already done the work. It's faster, it's easier. You don't have to burn as many internal resources on uh, accomplishing the task at hand. Yeah, and just, just for the audience's sake, understand that that you know, when you're looking at onboarding a carrier, you've got services, regions, rates, uh, labels and communication, right? You've got all those things that you need to worry about. And yes, those labels can really be a sticker. Uh, um, and the nice thing is, is that is that a multi-carrier shipping company, multi-carrier shipping software company, should have people like Dave that are in contact with Josh and Dick's people. That when a change needs to happen, it gets pushed out to you, so you don't have to ever expend any IT resources to make that happen. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, you know, as Dick said, the, the three most difficult parts of uh, implementation, integration, integration, integration. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's talk through some of this as what, uh, what some of the concerns that somebody might need to be prepared for. Now at ProShip, we've got a ton of different things that we try to prepare our customers for. Um, but Josh, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Is there anything you would tell your customers that you wanna make sure that you're prepared for during the integration process? I think it's really just, again, you said getting your ducks in a row here, making sure that you've got all of the resources signed up ahead of time, right? And and, and knowing what it's gonna to take to do the integration, you know, wrangling all the cats that may be necessary when you haven't walked on through that and thought of that through uh, upfront is really gonna elongate that time. And I would say easily that's gonna jump at least 30 days um, without you know you know really putting a pen to it. And Dick, do you have anything to add to add to what you can do to shorten that most critical triple piece of the process? Yeah, I agree with Dave's comments on on the label. I, you know, sometimes we get down to the one yard line, and that's the thing that you know trips us up or trips the shipper up. Uh, but I think that second bullet there, you know, uh, is is oftentimes the biggest thing we see, okay? That do you have IT resources, be they multi-carrier systems, which, you know, from my point of view is always easier, you know, with a, I don't know how many customers we've onboarded together with just ProShip, but, you know, the fifth time was a lot easier than the first time. So, you know, and and we know some of the, the traps you can fall into that Dave touched on. So, but I think, you know, um, IT resources get pulled for different priorities. You know, I think part of the reason we hear is, and the reason I'm so good to October 4th and Josh isn't, is that, you know, laser ship covers a bigger area and more population, so they get onboarded sooner, on track ahead of us as well, and then us is generally how it, how it comes about. So that's uh, kind of the way it works. But having IT resources scheduled and not yanked on a whim, uh, I, that's the main thing that trips it up. Yeah, and that's why second quarter is often the best for integrations, though I, at ProShip here, we are doing a ton of third quarter and fourth quarter integrations. But uh, yeah, picking a time when your internal IT resources are gonna be available to answer questions, are gonna be available to smooth data flow in the enterprise software stack um, uh, can be really helpful to streamlining that process. So we got a question here from Tom Reitz at Finish Line. Um, to add to the current topic, to avoid line hauls, when does it make sense for regionals to pick up at store locations when the volumes are 20 to 50 per day? So it's kind of a combo question there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it again. To avoid line hauls, when does it make sense for regionals to pick up at store locations when volumes are 20 to 50 a day? Dick, I, let me go back to you and then Josh, you'll, you'll get the follow up. Look, I we we like ship from store. We're good at it. You know, we have several customers that do it. Uh, Lone Star Overnight was founded on the infrequent shipper 
you know, for the the small to medium sized shipper who was under loved in Texas by uh, FedEx and UPS, ergo the name Lone Star Overnight. So, you know, uh, I'll pick up today an overnight letter, say, for example, in Tyler, Texas, and deliver it, you know, tomorrow morning in San Antonio, and maybe never see that law firm again for months, and I'm okay with that. So doing uh, regularly scheduled pickups or on-call pickups uh, with no minimum volume commitment at stores is fine by me. Okay, Josh? Yeah, I would say, you know, really ultimately it makes sense um, in general, but have those conversations with the, the carrier, right? Not every store is going to be the right fit for it. Uh, so again, you seem to have that exploration, but in general, you know, and I guess I'll speak for all regionals is here that, you know, we want that volume and we want to work with you to, right? All of the volume that can go through a regional should be going through the regional. And so it's really um, making sure that you've got the right flexibility in the store or the the, the IT solution's got to be able to print the each carrier label from the store. So each one of the nodes has got to be set up and then, you know, just having that communication and get it set up. So it sounds like a real possibility and um, uh, not one that that is, uh, uh, other than the last bullet point we got on here, which I'm going to touch and then move us on. So we've got time for questions because they are racking up. Uh, I won't say last call for questions, but we're getting close. <laughs> uh, so one of the problems in a store is obviously physical, the physical layout, right? So make sure as you're onboarding any carrier uh, that you've got the space, whether you're going to put it in a tote, whether you're going to palletize it, or whether you're going to have uh, a 40 some foot trailer parked permanently at a dock, whether it's a warehouse or a store, whatever the case may be, make sure you know how you're physically going to make this happen. Make, the, uh, uh, make it significantly easier on your operators, whether they be warehouse, or store associates. Okay, uh, customer expectations. Um, I guess this one is 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 not every carrier is the same. So I, I'd like to I'd like to talk through um, what are some of the things that 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 you guys look for, some of the things you guys recommend to customers to make sure that your regional or any regional is a proper fit for them. Josh, let me throw it to you first. Yeah, again, it's, you know, really getting that communication, having those exploratory phone calls to understand, you know, what are your shipping care, your package characteristics? What is the, the carrier in each region, right? They do have different dimensions. Our, I think our dimension restrictions are different from LSOs, which are different from on tracks, and, you know, on down the line. And so, you know, understanding where your fulfillment centers are, if you have non-conveyables or, or sortable FCs, and then, you know, having the right conversation to determine, you know, you know, which carrier is the right setup in each region. And, be able to make the, the node connections and get, get moving. And Dick, let me go ahead and throw that over to you about, about best fit. Yeah, a couple of things that are on the slide I'll mention is that uh, pallets, obviously we handle pallets when we do bulk pickups at the fulfillment center, but we're not in the LTL business. You know, uh, uh, say for example, GLS and Speedy are in their respective regions, we're not. Okay, that's just not what we do. The other thing that uh, generally doesn't work uh, or has a hard time working is if somebody's using Postal Now and getting slower service but not willing to pay a penny more, that almost, especially below one pound, uh, okay, um, almost never works. So, you know, the, you just uh, have to get real and say, uh, if, if, me or any of the other regional carriers are a good fit or not, but it's not hard to figure out. You know, we've all been doing this long enough now where we can look at it and say, you know, LTL now, uh, postal, okay, what are your expectations there? Well, yes or no, uh, you know, but, um, you know, in, in terms of the size of customer, like I said, you know, I'll take somebody who ships one package, you know, the um, that's not the issue. Uh, outside the service area it is, but other than that, you know, bring it on. Excellent, excellent. All right, questions are stacking up, so we're kind of going to keep this one a little bit short, um, but let's talk about, let's talk about peak, right? Um, uh, my first question is, predictions for 2021 peak, are they going to be, are we going to be better off as a country or worse off than we were last year? Um, Dick, let me throw that to you. 
Well, I think it's going to be a very frothy, high volume peak, higher than last year. I mean, some of the forecasts we're getting from some of our customers, uh, which we won't be able to totally handle, are in the 300% range from non-peak. And so uh, getting out in front of that and you know, having those conversations is what I'm pushing my team to do to make sure that uh, we've got realistic expectations. Um, I think the the nationals are going to cap more than they have and drop people more than they have in 2020. I don't think I think they've demonstrated that um, that that's the case, and uh, and we can help. You know, the the thing I think you'll get from all of us, and you know, I know Josh well enough to know say this is true. You know, we're gonna we're gonna be honest with you. We're gonna tell you what what we can do and what we can't do. We're gonna communicate well. And if we make a commitment, and you know, we're going to live by it. Exactly. Exactly. Excellent. Josh, what's your thoughts on this upcoming peak? Look, I would generally agree with with what Dick stated here. I do think that you know there are going to be some some caps. We've are we're getting you know we started getting peak forecast in April of this year. That definitely was the earliest that uh, that we've ever received those. And they're looking for feedback here, right? Trying to understand, you know, where where the national carriers are going to come in and and, and put some screws down and uh, forced out some some early capping. Uh, you know, UPS changed a bit of the the playbook on the peak surcharges already this year with adding adding tiers. You know, I, at least uh, I haven't been on the uh, computer from traveling earlier today, but so I'm not sure if FedEx announced uh, today or something like that. But we're still waiting for maybe FedEx's peak surcharge uh, announcement as well. You know, I'm not sure where that's going to hit. We already know that UPS started earlier than they did uh, in 2020. So, uh, and, and those are the actual holiday peak surcharges, right? They still have peak surcharges that have been going on all year long since January. And so, I would say that we would expect more of the same. And you know, we're all, um, you know, again, you know, be honest and, and work with your carriers and, and your regional carriers up front. We're gonna we're gonna stand up and do everything we can for our for our retailers. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, just a reminder, everybody, I wanted to leave some time here so we could go through some questions. We've got some stacked up. I apologize. I haven't been able to process them quickly enough. There still is time to throw some questions in there. Uh, go ahead and use that uh, question uh, option on uh, on the present presentation to, to do that. And guys, let's let's move to those questions. Um, we got one from uh, I apologize for my pronunciation here. Uh, Guru Prakash, I think, is the uh, is the pronunciation uh, from Cognizant. And, and the ask is: Is the market right for a dominant middle market LSP who can bridge the shipper with a last mile carrier? Okay. Do you guys see maybe an LTL company or somebody like that? Uh, maybe YRC. I'm, I'm just throwing names out here, right? Uh, all of a sudden. Uh, deciding that they will go ahead and fill in that middle that middle mile for you or that first mile for you. Um, uh, Josh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, we've seen some of this already. We've seen some some uh, new, new entrants into the market trying to do consolidation of moves across the country. There's, you know, One Live Express. We've seen Air Terra come out last year. You know, some of Pandians coming out. Right. There's going to be some more of those trying to move and trying to fill the middle mile void. Uh, and, you know, other folks like you know, J.B. Hunt and some others that I've seen have been kind of doing that even a little bit from Ryder in the past, um, moving some of that volume around the country. I don't know if there's going to be a big dominant player on that front. If, I, if I'm being honest, I don't see that unfolding um, in the tea leaves, but uh, there'll probably be some more. I mean, I've seen some stuff starting to get moved intermodal a little bit even. So I think nothing's off the table and the capacity crunch. but Look, we're going to catch up to that at some point uh, and continue sort of building that out. So I'm not I'm not really sure there's going to be a dominant player on that front. Excellent. And, and Dick, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the pandians of the world and whatnot, you know, the, I think to be determined as to what role they'll play. Some interesting, um, you know, value propositions and some very experienced people behind some of these. So. But you know, getting critical mass is is hard. You know, the uh, to connect the dots, so to speak. You know, I don't know. I, you know, I I think there's a role for, and it's probably easier for legacy three PLs 
think trans plays, Josh mentioned Ryder or something like that. And where we've seen that, and we play nice with others, you know, we'll work with 3PL, not a problem. You know, that where we've seen that is where the customer has really shoved them into doing it because it's not a core competency. And, you know, uh, for example, Transplace bought scan data, you know, as a case in point, you know, to get that capability. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they'll do something with it. What it is, I don't know, you know, at, at this point. Do I think there's a role for it? Yes. The alternative is the shipper is their own 3PL. And if they have the techno uh, technology and people and processes to be able to manage it, it's probably the, the best way. And volume. Excellent. All right. Next question. This one, I'm not sure if this is going to be a quick question or if it's going to take up a lot of time here. Uh, but Nate Skyver asks, uh, with capacity demand expected to remain above supply for the foreseeable future, how aggressively will regional carriers be expanding capacity within the current coverage areas and or expanding new coverage areas? So, guys, obviously you guys did not know this question was coming. It's a very detailed question. Uh, Josh, do you want to take a whack at this one first? Sure. Appreciate the question, Nate. Good to hear from you. Uh, look, you know, it, it's in LaserShip's DNA to be uh, uh, an, a really a growth-oriented organization. We added uh, new states and jurisdictions this year, added over 18% uh, to our actual service area in, in 2021. We even grew and added new greenfield locations in, in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. So we're going to continue to do that. I think we're adding, I think we're actually moving 20 buildings that we didn't plan or budget to move in 2021 uh, to manage the growth and, and have more capacity, right, to hit peak or to beat peak of, of next year. We're adding another sort center um, that we hadn't planned uh, to add for uh, for 2020-21. And so also we're going to continue to really uh, get out in front of, we made early investments uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020, and we're just kind of on this sort of evolving uh, capacity growth rate. So I think you're going to see, um, you know, others do and, and very similar things. But as far as I'll just speak for ourselves, uh, we're going to we're going to be on a, a high growth trajectory uh, as far as capacity build out. We're going to maintain that. Nick, hey, what's LSO's answer to that? Yeah, and that's such a neat question. I mean that in the best possible way. Very thoughtful and uh, on point question. Uh, well, last year we uh, grew our overall business by 70% and our e-commerce business, which is now our number one product by 185%. We're on track to do that again, uh, thanks in large part to the fact that we have a, a new private equity owner who's very interested in growth and investing. We put several million dollars to work in terms of new CapEx and technology and we've expanded we're expanding to five states by uh september so uh you know much like laser ship and um uh, you know the we're we're in this for the long term we're building for long-term growth and capacity uh it won't all come overnight but um, there's definitely a commitment on my board's part to do just that excellent all right uh next question is from uh tony he asks, uh, how do you convince e-commerce companies to feel comfortable using regional carriers after years of only using national carriers? And um, uh, I, I'd love to hear you guys, and I actually want to want to get an answer in on this one. Uh, so, Dick, let's go back to you. E-commerce companies, how do you make them come, come to you? Well, uh, the, the thing that's been the most helpful, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, is that the sales prevention department the uh, efforts at FedEx and UPS have been uh, good for our business. I, I mean, you know, the people are coming to us just because they've been abused by FedEx and UPS. And, you know, I don't know that that's going to last forever. You know, they're going to eventually catch up on capacity. But, you know, the right now, that's probably the, uh, the biggest factor. Now, I've got a sales and marketing team who go out and we target, um, you know, specific companies. We prioritize what we believe to be strong brands that are going to be there for the long run and uh, things of that nature. So, um, yeah, it's um, and, and and we're getting a lot more inbound than, say, we did two years ago, you know, where people are coming to us. Uh, I'd, I'd say it's probably 
it may not be quite half of our new business that we're onboarding for this year. And Josh, your, your thoughts on uh, trying to get get these people who've been single carrier for, for decades, get them into a regional mindset. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no convincing necessary. Uh, if you know, if they need to be convinced, then, then we're probably not a great fit. Um, you know, if I'm being totally honest, this, this that is a um, there may be some very uh, specific and acute reasons why that might be like a requirement or or so it doesn't really work. But for the vast general, uh, you know, millions of retailers in the U.S., you know, this is the right path forward. It's the only way to get things delivered faster because regionals have the largest one-day footprint and the largest two-day footprints within the regions that we operate in. We have a, a better uh, cost basis that can extend back to the to the consumer. And, and as Dick mentioned earlier, we, we have better on-time rates that are substantiated by companies like Ship Matrix and other um, auditors out there. So, you know, if you need to be convinced, you know, I wouldn't say ask us. There, there's, there's plenty of, uh, of major retailers that are, have, uh, have pushed this forward. And, and my answer here coming from, from somebody who is, makes a living off of helping companies go multi-carrier, whether that's just the nationals or what we recommend, which is to have a healthy mix of carriers. Um, I would say we, we've talked about this. There's actually a, a, a webinar out there uh, called a post peak review and look ahead to parcel shipping dominance in 2021 between myself and Mark Taylor of Invista. Uh, Mark Taylor will be a panelist uh, in one of our Pros Who Knows tomorrow as well. If you watch that, back in the day, there was a very clear cutoff at a certain number of hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue where you needed to look at a truly, just for, for business continuity's sake, you needed to look at that. Um, uh, that number continues to drop year after year, okay? And the pandemic, that number dropped down into, into like $5 million dollars. Uh, spend because you needed to make sure that you actually got things moving. Uh, so, so it's a great way to uh, um, it's a great way to go ahead and, and and get a deeper dive into that one question because we cover it very well in that webinar. But again, I'm gonna, just going to tell you, there's a certain point at at a, at a, at a retailer size where they're going to want to do that anyway, just for good business continuity. And what we found is is that the more retailers that do that, the sooner they do it more flexibility they have. Many of our customers get called, regardless of whether there's caps or not, they get called and they get said, they get asked, please stop uh, filling this lane. Can you please put that in, in, in a different carrier? Okay. Um, and being good partners, right, which, which uh, you know, Josh and Dick are great partners to have uh, when, when you're actually trying to do these things. If they call you up and say, hey, um, and quite frankly, it's not the regionals who are asking us to uh, trim back lanes. But if they said, hey, can you trim back on this lane? Most warehouse managers will do will do that. They'll use their multi-carrier shipping software, tweak the inputs a little bit and make that happen. If you don't have a regional carrier, if you don't have another carrier to, to take up that slack, are you gonna leave those packages sit on the dock? It's just not a good business plan. Once you reach a certain size, not to have backup plans and not to be leveraging those real time, okay? I don't believe in backup servers. I believe in active active because if you have to bring it up, you're gonna have downtime. You have to bring up a contract with a carrier during a peak season. You might be able to make that happen, but odds are not. So my recommendation to everybody is start looking at diversification of your carriers as early and as soon as possible. All right. Um, and then uh, the last question we're going to have time for, I'm sorry, everybody, if there, if there are any other questions, we'll try to get to them afterwards. Uh, this comes from uh, Jeffrey. Are you seeing any mix in the change where shippers are trying to promote commercial deliveries uh, in order to, re to help reduce the residential, um, basically the density challenge? Are you guys seeing our, our, our shippers trying to solve some of this density challenge problem for you? I guess that's the way I interpret the question. Me or Josh? Oh, I'm sorry, Dick, let's start with you. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, it, it, here's uh, you know one of the things we've seen that we've onboarded a few in this regard. So, uh, and this applies more to a specialty retailer than it does to 
you know, a, a larger retailer. But where they, uh, uh, one company in particular I'm thinking about, that uh, their nearest fulfillment center is uh, to Dallas is Phoenix, okay? And so they have a store line haul truck that comes into um, into uh, uh, Texas every day to do store deliveries uh, to replenish inventory. And so they didn't have enough volume for a truckload. So uh, I'd love to say it was my idea, it was their idea. You know, we'll put three Gaylords on the back of the truck, stop at your hub in Dallas, and then do the normal store deliveries. And then in some cases, uh, people were asking us, again, it's more specialty retailer, uh, to do store deliveries, which, you know, we like. I mean, it's much above 15 to 20 cartons. It's probably not a good deal for anybody. But, you know, in that range is another way, and that's a business uh, delivery. But, you know, some of our office products customers have a heavier mix of uh, business deliveries, which is fine. I mean, in many cases, we're going to those stops already. Excellent. And Josh, your thought on shippers attempting to affect uh, uh, delivery density and minimize residential deliveries? Yeah, I, I think I think they're maybe trying to fill some like truck issues for utilization to try to get volume if they're moving it across country. Maybe I think very similar to what Dick was saying. We we do store deliveries as an example. For uh, retailers, as a you know, not not in a traditional pool type environment, but you know, big box retailer, uh, we may be going to the the residences for you know residential delivery, and then you know, dropping a package or two off at a store as well, um, where it makes sense. But um, you know, that that's the extent that we're really seeing that. Excellent, excellent. All right, I did want to throw, Dick, I want to throw one other thing out your way, because um, uh, we we kind of touched on it yesterday, and I think that. Uh, Anybody who might be listening to this that might be dealing with vape products and might be affected by the PACT Act, um, uh, if I heard yesterday, uh, you guys are continuing to uh, to transport those. The uh, LSO is. Uh, I love vape. Okay, bring it on. Doesn't matter the volume. You know, uh, we'll cover it in you know Texas and Oklahoma. And for some reason, vape seems much heavier in Oklahoma. I don't on a per capita basis. I don't know why. Uh, but also as we expand into Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri. Uh, we've done the legal regulatory work. We've got systems and processes to, you know, uh, ensure to the largest degree possible that we get adult signature. We already do it for wine, so it wasn't a hard transition. I love that. Excellent, excellent. All right, guys, unfortunately, this is the, this is the um, last amount of time we have. Josh, Dick, David, thank you all for joining us today. I do want to mention uh, for those of you who do have another sh another presentation tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central, uh, question and answer, parcel industry consultants diving into peak planning for this year and years to come. Uh, Mark Taylor, as I mentioned before, will be on that. We look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you, everybody.